On Friday's show, we spoke about the conveyor belt that transports migrant bashing from Nigel Farage's Twitter feed to our Tory government via right-wing talk show hosts and tabloid front pages. The BBC have now got in on this dehumanizing act. So on BBC Breakfast this morning, that took the form of live commentary of an overcrowded boat carrying people seeking asylum to Dover. Let's take a look. Yeah, you can see why it's dangerous today because the sea is pretty choppy. And then we came across this boat around half an hour ago, just spotted it on the horizon. And we have seen them actually trying to get water out of the boat. They're doing that at the moment. They're using a plastic container just to try to bail out the boat. So obviously it's pretty overloaded there. People are wearing life jackets, but it is pretty dangerous just the number of people on board that boat. Let me just see. Are you okay? Are you all right? Okay? Okay. Okay. Where are you from? Syria. 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 Uh, how, how many people? How many? So they say they're from Syria, they say they're okay. I can see there are some women on board that boat as well, majority men, majority men. Where are you going? Where do you want to go? Their destination is Dover, obviously. So at the moment they're motoring through the channel. At the moment the boat seems to be safe, the engine seems to be going. When we were out on the channel on Friday, the boat we were following actually got very close to the White Cliffs before it actually broke down, the engine broke down. But at the moment, pretty choppy out there. They are bailing the boat out from time to time, but they seem to be safe at the moment. But obviously the Coast Guard has been alerted and they will be on their way. But this is a sight that is becoming increasingly common in the channel. We heard from the Coast Guard that a boat had set out early this morning, but no one was quite sure where it was. But then shipping was asked to look out for it. And then suddenly we spotted it. Often you can spot them from the life jackets, from the color of the life jackets makes it clear in the distance. But certainly at the moment, this boat heading towards Dover. And so we'll shadow it and just see how the situation develops. Now, what an extraordinarily dystopian piece of television. So he's not there giving any context as to why these people might be risking their lives crossing the channel. There's no story about the fact that these people could well be fleeing war and persecution. It's just treated, it's, it's kind of half nature program, half sports event. And I just, it's just such an odd dehumanizing form of journalism. Why is this even a live news story? I mean, I can imagine this being an interesting feature, but the idea that we should be doing live coverage of a few hundred people, a few hundred people seeking a better life, desperate people seeking asylum, for us to cover that like a sports event, I think is, you know, especially from our public broadcaster, just inhuman. I mean, you had it bang on the money when you said that this was dehumanizing coverage of desperate people in dangerous waters on a dinghy where they're having to bail out water with a plastic bucket. There's a real risk to their lives here. And this BBC journalist is covering it in a completely content and context free way. And I think you've got to look at where that comes from. Because while Nigel Farage having a direct conveyor belt, through right-wing media outlets, through to the BBC and through right-wing talk show hosts, right to the Conservative Party is a contemporary thing. The breathlessness of this kind of coverage and its orchestration isn't new at all. So when David Blunkett was Home Secretary, you might remember, I mean, this was when I was quite young, but I remember it very well, there became this public obsession with bogus asylum seekers. And this was in a way where you thought that at first it was an opposition between the new Labour government and the right-wing papers, in particular uh, at the time it was the Sun and the News of the World. Um, there was a kind of increase, a, you know, a flurry of activity. The coverage was heating up from these right-wing tabloids. And then you had David Blunkett writing an editorial uh, in one of these papers, vowing a new Labour crackdown. Um, and then it 
transpired that all of this was coordinated. It was an opportunity for New Labour to look like it was being tough on asylum seekers. And this became a real uh, obsession in that second Blair ministry. He had successful asylum applications uh, halving, and at the same time, he had temporary working visas, which turns uh, potential refugees into precarious workers. He had that kind of visa doubling. So this is a development and an intensification of a media phenomenon which has much longer origins, except now with social media, it's fairly uh, easy for a very media savvy political figure like Nigel Farage to just hack into it right away. And I'm afraid that journalists lack either the will, the curiosity, or perhaps, dare I say it, um, the professional skill to reframe it and to serve their audience well. So even when you have journalists and broadcasters who aren't necessarily hostile uh, to the humanity of migrants, they still feel the need to pose questions to them in ways which I think are gravely insulting to their humanity. I was half listening to Good Morning Britain this morning uh, and Adil Ray, who I genuinely think isn't a hostile interlocutor, was putting a question to Hassan Akkad, who's a Syrian refugee who made the crossing uh, via Turkey in the Calais jungle, flew into Heathrow uh, on a forged passport um, who filmed his whole journey, said, well, there's this feeling out there that asylum seekers are just here for benefits. Um, and while Hassan Akkad, because he's a very skilled uh, orator, was able to rebuff that question, the very framing of it, the legitimizing of this feeling, as though it is of equal value to facts, um, is a very worrying thing. And it can't just be left up to uh, individual refugees who have been able to uh, you know, meet the standards of sainthood necessary to be considered a human being to rebut some of these ideas. These are things which have to come from the media. And the last thing, because I know I've been rambling on for a bit that I want to say is that it's very worrying that broadcasters have adopted the language of illegal immigrants whenever they see these rubber dinghies of boats. Because strictly speaking, that's not true. You don't have to claim asylum in the first safe country that you reach. Um, if Even if you are one of the minority of refugees who comes to Europe, 85% of refugees are hosted by countries which neighbor uh, their home country. Um, but you don't have to claim asylum in the first safe place that you see. And if you reach the shores of this country and you claim asylum, you are not an illegal immigrant by definition. You are an asylum seeker until your case is processed. And so what's really worrying to me is that this dehumanizing language of illegal immigrant and sometimes just migrant uh, used in a way which has got this kind of venom to it is taking that work which was put in by this unholy alliance between New Labour and the right-wing tabloids of scaremongering around bogus asylum seekers. And it's using these images of desperate people who've been dehumanized, demonized as criminal and dirty to then also delegitimize immigration as a whole. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's quite important to be specific. I'm going to go to Aaron, Aaron in one moment, but what was, or what I think was wrong with that video, because I think there might be some people who watch that and say, well, he was reasonably polite and obviously it's legitimate mm. to film people, you know, doing what is a, I suppose, interesting, worrying activity, however you want to frame it. But if that was done in a sensitive way with context, um, maybe that would have been fine. But to do it as live coverage, as if it is a sporting event, I do think is very distasteful. I suppose one last thing I'd say is, that, you know, I saw a lot of people saying, why don't they just let them on the boat? And I'm not actually sure that is the best critique of it, because I think I, I don't even know what the law is on that. But I think the idea that as a journalist, if you keep out of it as much as possible until you have no choice, I'm sure if it capsized, right, they wouldn't just film them drowning um so, so i wasn't that convinced by the idea of don't let them on the boat but i just thought it was it was a piece of footage which was incredibly dehumanizing it was the breathlessness right i mean i was watching it and i felt like i was watching you know the oj car chase mm, exactly so it was a spectacle it was just pure spectacle and the humanity of the people involved was i think that the broadcaster didn't really know what to do with it so he kind of ineffectually is like are you okay Mm. They say they're okay. And so that what that indicates to me is that he he doesn't have um the ability to within that context um 
provide better coverage that his audience so sorely deserves. Yeah, no, I thought that the live aspect I thought was terrible. I think it makes for terrible journalism. I think it's deeply unprofessional. I think it's deeply unethical. Uh, and why have they done it? Because it will probably get the most traffic and it's very cheap. You know, tomorrow we're going to send out a small crew of three people, you know, a, uh, a director of production, the presenter and the cameraman. You're going to go out on a on a boat and you're going to you know record some people and it will go out live. And like you say, what would have been far better is a feature, speak to people consensually. There's also, by the way, there's a big question about the, eth the journalistic ethics of this, just recording people who are very vulnerable. It's like recording somebody who's just been assaulted on the street or robbed without their consent. You know, it's a, I think it's a deeply, I actually probably think it's probably against the BBC's own uh, general uh, conventions on journalistic ethics. I'm very surprised it was done actually. Uh, similar in some ways to the sort of the live streaming of the Cliff Richard housebreaking, the only difference being by the police a few years ago. The only difference being, of course, these people are powerless and won't have a, have the ability to get a lawyer and, and to sue potentially. But it does tell you a great deal about the more uh, problematic uh, areas of our, our country's journalistic life. And like you said, it's the BBC. This should be public service broadcast. This should be uh, precisely the place where you can get informed, context-driven uh, feature writing, feature broadcast it hasn't happened. Uh, and so I, I think, it was, again, I think it was something of an addict. You know, it was, it was, it was very close to reality TV. It was incredibly close. Uh, and this is not the first time we're seeing it at the BBC. We saw it even often with the coverage of the Labour Party. You know, it, it looked like, a, um, you know, one of these kind of uh, telenovelas from Latin America. Laura Koonsberg thought she was actually one of the one of the protagonists within the story. You know, this this reality TV show like Big Brother, you know, one day a ding dong between this person and Jeremy Corbyn, this person, and Jeremy Corbyn. That isn't journalism and nor is this. And then finally. Uh, you know, I, I wonder what, what's what's the best, and I, I think it's something for our audience as well, what's the best way for left-wing media, left-wing journalists to deal with this? Because I don't think we would want to do that. I don't think we would want to live stream that. To me, that was kind of like one rung below Jeremy Kyle. I mean, I, you could have done the exact same thing with Jeremy Kyle there. Nobody thinks Jeremy Kyle is a journalist, right? He, he was a reality TV provocateur shouting at people, and it would be the same thing. And it, I think it's really, really troubling. And then finally, on the same day, it's, it's attracted less media coverage, but I watched it in real time. I said, good morning. It was this morning uh, with India Willoughby. She was being interviewed. Uh, and she said, I think it's time that, you know, the French say they want 30 million a year to sort it. I think we should put barbed wire in the English channel. You know, five years ago, that was Katie Hopkins. And it was called out for the rancid Sado populism that it is. And yet she, she said this and people didn't really respond. Nobody's come on, that's, that's really outrageous. And you have to wonder and be worried about how normalized these, these discourses are becoming. You know, is that a normal thing to say now? I didn't think it was. Maybe it is. Is that, I think one of the problem, problems is, is that we've got a media culture which rewards right-wing stupidity. Mm. Now, I've got no idea how India Willoughby identifies her own politics. It might be the case that, I don't know, she's a long time reader of the morning star that's not what i mean when i'm talking about right-wing stupidity i'm talking about things which fit into a right-wing frame which views uh you know migration by desperate people is inherently illegitimate as threatening and something which has to be guarded against you know almost like you would you know bacteria a virus something mm. dirty and something wrong and it's something which is i think really quite deep in bits of the nation's psyche um and i think that you have no better finger on you know the clogged artery of middle england than when you watch morning television uh on the jeremy vine show this morning there were callers uh, calling in saying the country is full when i was on question time once a woman said the country is sinking um, we're overcrowded. We can't fit any more. Now, Glasgow is a city built for a million. It's currently got 600,000. You've got demographic aging. You've got a low productivity economy. Um, you've also got a lot of land you could build more housing on. And you also have a lot of empty properties, which are just as investment mm. portfolios for the very wealthy in London. Yeah. Um, it's absolutely not true that we don't have the room. We don't have the physical room. But this level of um, complete meatheadedness has been validated by a media culture which says that your feeling of being threatened or swamped by scary migrants is as legitimate as a discussion 
of Britain's international obligations, the real facts about the movement of people, the fact that actually Britain isn't seeing the majority of asylum applications made to European countries. We have, you know, about 30,000 fewer than Greece even, and that's not even get started on France and Germany, that we don't have a particularly generous benefit system. You have 44,000 asylum seekers living on five pounds a day. You try building a life on five pounds a day. You've got a media culture which says, yes, madam, I know that you've got a sirloin steak where your brain should be, but that doesn't mean that you can't weigh in on this discussion about what to do with deeply traumatized and vulnerable people as though you are an expert. And I think that's something that's wrong. I think that's something that's really wrong. The devaluing of firsthand knowledge of Mm. what it's like to work in the sector and what it's like to be an asylum seeker as well. You know, I I don't want to obsess about the the numbers thing, because even if there were half a million people trying to cross the channel, I still think saying that we're going to put up barbed wire so they sink would be, you know, disgraceful. But I think the fact that we are pushed to a point where people are openly saying on morning television that what we should do is intentionally drown people who are coming to this country to seek asylum. You know, it killed them, essentially. We've been driven to that because 4,000 people have crossed the channel. Now, that's like two secondary schools. You know, we're a country of 60 million people. Uh, people that could fill two secondary schools have come over, and that is such... A, a challenge to our identity and, and British civilization that it has become acceptable to talk about intentionally killing people. Like, uh, uh, how low is the threshold to drive us into, you know, basically the language of fascism? Mm-hmm.